a lot of work going up to this you good, one minute. Oh, yeah. You look great, actually. <laughs> no, that's a word you <laughs> wanted to hear. Right before we start. Okay, you, you guys ready? I'm gonna, go, let's go. I'm going to clap so I, I know a place to, to go, okay? Okay. All right, we're on this one? Yep. Good. Yo, welcome to the Bub and Bob Show, where we are talking about faith, culture, and America from a Christian point of view or a Christian worldview. My guest today is an awesome guy. I met him a while back, and we've become actually pretty dear friends. He's written a lot of books, but the two I'm going to talk about is God a Moral Monster and True for You But Not for Me. He's also a professor, very smart guy. Love this guy. I'm glad he's here. Welcome, Paul Copan. Mm, thanks glad so much, here. Bob. Appreciate Welcome it. Welcome to the Bub and Bob Show. Yeah, yeah. this is so fun. Yeah. So before we get into... Uh, the stuff that I really want to talk about there are the are the books and the stuff that you're known for. I want to go back uh, as far as we can think about and go back to when what your journey was that the Lord used to finally move you to become a believer. Do you, do you recall that journey? Do you know? Tell me a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in a pastor's home. My parents came from the old country, Ukraine and Latvia. Yeah. And wow. uh, my dad was pastoring a Russian Ukrainian church in Cleveland, Ohio for a number of years, which is where I was born and grew up in a family of seven children and had a wonderful nurturing home. And uh, it was, uh, wasn't until I came to high school though, that I really started to see the foundations of my faith, mm -hmm. that it wasn't just something that I inherited from my parents, uh, but actually it was a faith that I could own for myself yeah. because it was true. So I got exposed to uh, Christian apologetics. I started to read uh, books about the resurrection and about the, the historical reliability of scripture. And, and how so old on. were you here at this point? How old were you? I was you in high school. school. Wow. So, Reading so. those books in high school. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah. And then I uh, went to college, was planning on doing some sort of a uh, uh, ministry overseas and um, just you know, kind of worked my way forward to, to prepare for that. Went to Trinity Seminary. Wow. And, um, you know, again, that high school time was very formative for me and seeing the strong foundations of the Christian faith yeah. that I was proclaiming something that was true. Yeah. That wasn't just something that I grew up with and uh, made me feel happy or something, um, but so much more than that. And so uh, when I was at Trinity Seminary, I don't know if I'm running ahead here, but no, no, it's good. Uh, yeah. But I, uh, but I, uh, in my first semester there, I took a philosophy class and that philosophy class with Stuart Hackett uh, hmm. was one that really helped me get a lot of excellent answers, found out that I like this philosophy hmm. stuff, and ended up taking on an additional major, so a Master of Divinity as well as a Master of Arts in Philosophy of Religion. And so that really helped to give me a good taste of what uh, the life of the mind can look like yeah. and how these tools that are available for the Christian to utilize and to help make sense of the, the, the Christian faith and how to articulate it even. Right. I just found that I had a, a great platform to speak to people because I had a philosophy background. So when I went on staff with the church in upstate New York for six and a half years, um, I had campus ministries going yeah. on and I would go to a nearby university or college and would speak to students. And the fact that I had a philosophy background, spoke to their debating society every term and and they it was just a great time of engagement. And so it was that that one class that led to my seeing the value of it in, in, in Christian ministry. Mm -hmm. And then my wife said, how about getting a PhD? And so we, your went, wife, my wife, your yeah, wife said that my okay. wife, a yeah, wonderful woman. And <laughs> You're not she, smart enough yet. Go get a PhD. <laughs> that's right, that's it. What's wrong yeah. with you? Yeah. And so I said, perfect. And so we had four kids at the time and we ended wow. up going to Wisconsin. I went to Marquette university to get my PhD in philosophy. Our fifth child was born in Wisconsin and uh, it was a wonderful time. And then, I uh, just did other things and a Christian apologetic work with Ravi Zacharias for National Ministries and then going on down to Palm Beach Atlantic University in 2004 and been there ever since teaching philosophy, yeah. ethics, Christian worldview, apologetics, that sort of thing. So that's great. That's that's the broad view. Let's I'm going to do a Genesis 1, 2, 3 thing. So I'm going to go back to the specifics now. Was there a point where you where you knew that you were a sinner and there was a point where you're like, okay, I believe what people are saying about Christ. I believe... Mm -hmm. At least parts of what I'm reading in the mm -hmm. Bible, I know that there's a conviction in my heart, mm -hmm. and where you actually surrendered, and and you, about what age was that? Oh. oh, I remember I was five years of age, and I was thinking I'm going to go through this whole day without doing anything wrong, yes. and uh, I was a miserable failure yes. within the first hour, <laughs> and uh, you know, I mean, I, I was very well aware of sin shortcomings, but I also there's just something 
that gave me a, a confidence about what Jesus had come to do, that there was something that needed to be done mm -hmm. on my behalf. And the Christian faith made sense. Yeah. It, it just seemed to, uh, to resonate with me, fit uh, very well with the things that I was going through, the fact that I needed forgiveness, the fact that uh, there is a, a God to whom I'm accountable, the, the, the fact that I can't make it on my own mm -hmm. and I need outside assistance. And so, I mean, I saw that all kind of all along the way, but it was really in, in high school that I came to see very strong foundations for this. It's not as though it's just a good mm -hmm. story, which it is. Right. Um, but it's, as C.S. Lewis said, this is myth became fact. Yeah. That this was yeah. something that really uh, encapsulates the wisdom of the ages from various traditions. But Jesus is the embodiment, uh, the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom yeah. and knowledge. So yeah. I began that's, seeing that's your, that. That's your verse. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. That, that's, the, that's the verse you like. Yeah. So what was, it growing, what was it like growing up at the Copan house? I mean, at five... Mm -hmm. You're realizing that, you know, you need Christ. So obviously this was around. You said he had a, a wonderful upbringing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's yeah. uh, how many kids and how, how was all that whole thing like and how did that shape your faith? Yeah. Um, well, just a wonderful, you know, you've got instant community yeah. like that. Right. And uh, so having, a, you know, being in a family of seven kids, my grandmother was also living with us. Okay. We would care for her. And so it was very... Um, you know, my parents had been through the war in Europe and uh, there was so much, you know, really, you, you really see that stamp yeah. of the greatest generation uh, upon them. And so it was a real privilege to be in a home where they had a very clear sense of right and wrong, mm -hmm. uh, they're, uh, of strong moral character. They, the, my parents were dedicated servants of the Lord. They uh, weren't in it for the show. Uh, they were very much uh, full of heart and dedication and servanthood and humility and not caring about who gets the credit. And uh, they just were excellent role models for us. They loved us well. We, uh, yeah, They've died in, in recent years, and mm. so we miss them. Yeah. Uh, but we are so grateful for the, the heritage that we have. And all of, our, all of my siblings just are, you know, there's just such a, almost a, yeah, just an awe that we have yeah. uh, for our parents and uh, how well they raised us, how well they loved us, and so we are we are grateful and blessed. That's, are all the siblings like that now, having larger families like you do, and and the same thing? Um, right no, I mean they they you know some have um, you know families of you know you know of their own. Yeah. You know, not not all, but um, but yeah, there's uh, definitely you know, even in the next generation, there is an appreciation for the heritage. Absolutely. Uh, that they have. And, you know, of course, my wife's uh, parents, they came from Holland. They went through the, the war in Holland, Nazi-occupied Holland. And so there's that stream also coming to our kids and, uh, and a great appreciation that, uh, that our kids have for that, for that heritage. So really in the end of the next generation, uh, I think a great uh, appreciation for that. And we, our parents have written their memoirs and, yeah, all they and have. Yeah, we have, um, yeah, I'd like to one day write a book uh, about, about this, but yeah. just stories of being in my mom being surviving the bombing of Berlin and uh, being in, you know, having great aunts who were in Dresden, Germany, when it was oh. bombed and being in the, in Moscow during the Russian revolution, when it broke out and my grandmother having an encounter with the Serena yeah. of Russia. So all sorts of uh, fascinating Paul, stories. Speaking of war, Bob and I both had brothers that we actually warred with. Did you, mm -hmm. was, there, was there one of the brothers in the family that you specifically uh, were a favorite of? Uh, uh, that I was a favorite of, it's like a, a pick like on. A pick on. We know we all got along well. Um, really? We, I did have a, you know, my sister has apologized to me about this, my younger sister. Uh, she would like to instigate um, uh, you know, you know, little squabbles with me. And, uh, you know, so I would warn her and said, don't do it. And, but she's, you know, I mean, it was, yeah. it was not anything that was malicious or mean. I mean, we, we all really got along quite yeah. well. Yeah. I was yeah. looking, yeah. I was looking forward to having someone of a really bad character on first. <laughs> So I can compare with me, but I'm like, I get the, I get St. St. Paul here. Uh, well. it's a, so here's me and my brother. St. and Sinner Paul. St. and Sinner. No, I know. It's right like, I, it's well. like, uh, okay. So here's what I, my, I did with my brother because he was really fast and tall. I could never catch him. So I would hide D batteries in the couch. And he'd come hit me on the back of the head and think I couldn't catch him. And I grabbed the battery and threw it. And I hit see. Him. Wow. He'd have welts on the back of his back. Wow. So wow. that's your sister and you aren't like that. 
Yeah, no, 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 no. no it was, uh, there were, we were, we were always at the positive pole, yes. never at the uh, negative. Okay. Pole there, yeah. Oh, so. that's a good reference. That's good. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think mine hit square in the back. I there just like go. both poles in the right in the, in yeah, the spine. There you go. This, yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, we're not going to get highly re- charged relationships. Yeah. Thank there. you. Well done. We're, we're not going to, we're not going to get, uh, some spine. smooth. Did you say spline, I said guys? spline. It's a combination Cut. between the spine and the spleen. Cut. You didn't know this? Bob, Bob should be off camera and silent as yes. often as All possible. Right. Go ahead, keep going. No, so okay, so I'm going to switch over quick to. Uh, I want to play a skeptic with you, mm-hmm. and kind of get into your your book is God a moral monster? And these things have been posed to me. They're they're. You know, when I was growing up, I never heard this stuff. Mm-hmm. Never heard all the things that the new atheists bring out, and all the people when you know all of a sudden we got, you know, our phones and smartphones and and social media, and everyone's just throwing stuff out because they can mm-hmm. be anonymous. They don't have to face anyone. So all these newer, there might mean it be newer questions, but they're more popular now. Mm-hmm. So the the big one is why why does it seem that God is so grumpy in the Old Testament, and then all of a sudden he's full of life and grace and love in the New Testament? How do we reconcile that God? I mean, I. Mm-hmm. I, I think they're the same, obviously, but yeah. I mean, from your point of view and your studies, what? Yeah. Well, I think it's useful to go to the New Testament and see how the New Testament views the God of the Old Testament, right. especially in, in, in Jesus. And Jesus is actually one who isn't shrinking from identifying with that God. In fact, uh, being the revealer of that God, being God himself. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's interesting that in, for example, Jude 5, uh, the best manuscripts have uh, mentioned that you know, using the word Jesus, that mm-hmm. you know, after the Israelites were delivered from Egypt, um, Jesus destroyed them because of their disobedience. Yes. So here the the New Testament, this Christo, Christocentric yeah. view, putting Jesus into the fray of the Old yeah. Testament also includes him in this. And, and I think it's a reminder, and of course, Jesus, there's judgment. You know, Jesus is one who talks about God's commandments in the Old Testament that involved capital punishment, Absolutely. Matthew uh, chapter 15. Uh, or Jesus saying that you know, this false teacher Jezebel in Revelation mm-hmm. 2, that he is going to cast her on a bed of sickness and he is going to strike her followers dead. Yes. Um, again, this is a temporal judgment. And, and, uh, and, and so we see that some of the things that are part of the Old Testament, you know, we have you know, 1,400 or so years here, yeah. 1,500 years of you know, what people will say, look, you know, God is angry, uh, jealous, <laughs> right. uh, judging, and so forth. Well, we only have 40, 50 years in the New Testament, right. but yet we have you know, you know, these affirmations of, of what this God did in the Old mm-hmm. Testament. Um, and also Jesus identifying with that God. And we see those sorts of things going on in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira being struck right. dead or Elamus being struck blind and so forth. Um, and Jesus threatening judgments in Revelation 2 mm-hmm. and 3 and so forth. So so uh, Re- Paul says in Romans eleven twenty two, he says, behold the kindness and severity of God. Um, and we see both kindness and severity. In fact, as we look at the Old Testament, we see that God is dealing with a bunch of people who are, I mean, is, he delivers them. They complain and rebel. He makes a covenant with them. They uh, they forsake it and, sell, and, and uh, you know, they have this fatted, the, 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 the worshiping the golden calf yeah. and so forth, um, that routinely, they're quickly, uh, abandoning. And he's patient with them over exactly. that time. It's not like they do it immediately and then he, and he crushes them or strikes yeah. them down. It's God years. Is, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So God is being very patient. I mean, when, when the term jealousy comes up, it's because these people are breaking the covenant right. that God has made with them. Uh, sort of like you know, uh, God being a, a, a wounded husband right. after his wife is running off uh, after right. other men. A, a so, righteous jealousy. You should yeah, be. Exactly. You should be jealous yeah. because, yeah. It's a jealousy that comes not from immaturity, but a jealousy that comes from pain. Yeah. And uh, perfection, is, right? He's also yeah, perfect. Well, absolutely, so, I mean, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, so we see those sorts of uh, emotions that are, uh, that are there. And God is dealing with the people who are, uh, you know, it, it's it's kind of the, a messy situation yeah. on the ground. God doesn't wait until these people are morally mature, like all of us are right, in, the, right, in the 21st right. century. Right. And uh, you know, He works with what He has on the ground. He works with people who are uh, involved in all sorts of fallen, messy social and moral mm-hmm. structures. And you know, just think, you know, how would I bring, say, democracy to a place like Saudi Arabia? Right. Uh, you know, well. 
<laughs> Try to apply that maybe to the Old Testament yeah. and you'll get some sort of an idea yeah. uh, that this is something that you can't legislate uh, an ideal utopian society into existence. God begins with a lot of messiness, works with them, but prepares a context uh, for the coming of Jesus, mm -hmm. the Messiah, bringing salvation to all that God's we're beginning with Israel uh, in a particular way has a universal intent that God seeks to bring blessing to the ends of the earth, beginning with Abraham through the nation of Israel. And uh, despite all of its rebellion and so forth, God is still patiently sticking with them. And through them, uh, the, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the, the seed of Abraham comes in order to bring this redemption uh, that extends to the yeah, ends of the earth. So there's God who steps into our mess you know, God steps into a mess in the Old Testament. Yep. God steps into a mess in the New <laughs> Testament uh, in Jesus. And, uh, and again, allows himself to go through the, the anguish of, uh, of suffering, death, injustice. Uh, he faces it squarely. He gives his life for his enemies. Mm -hmm. uh, that this is the God who is speaking uh, in the Old Testament, but now reveals himself in a very clear, concrete way in Jesus of Nazareth. And when you're looking at how low God is willing to go for our salvation, mm. look at the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is behind that that stuff? What, I mean, you, you think that's a legitimate question or are people throwing this stuff out as smoke screens? I mean, what have you found when you're just discussing this with people to be, yeah. is it... Well, you'll probably have a range of uh, range of views. Um, uh, for some, it may be smoke screens. For others, it's you know, some honest questioning. Yeah. It's yeah. not as though these are just easy questions. And if you only saw it from my <laughs> angle, then right. all the problems would go away. I mean, they're tough, tough questions. Yeah, no, tough. no doubt about it. And I don't want to uh, rule out. It's important for us to engage in in this this honest questioning yeah. and, and asking too. Uh, what is the best way of approaching these texts? Uh, I think some people are quick to dismiss them, right. quick to say, oh, that wasn't God who actually commanded those things. It wasn't God who actually did those things. That was just the ancient author who said, thus says the Lord, when it wasn't, thus says right. the Lord is just the, the, thus says me and my fallen ancient Near Eastern uh, violent uh, worldview. Yeah. Um, and I think we run into a lot of problems there because we, again, see in the New Testament these sorts of things reinforced. Um, Jesus himself brings mm -hmm. destruction. And, uh, and, and so, but, but I think it, it shows that uh, there is a God who takes sin seriously. I think we That's probably don't see, uh, you know, we obviously don't see the full picture here of a God who is wrathful towards sin and, and sees things like he saw how dangerous yeah. Israel's situation was, how quickly compromised Israel was mm -hmm. in idolatry and really losing uh, its sense of mission and, uh, and, and also pre preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Here, in a sense, the global mission to the world, the, sal the salvation of the world is at stake. And Israel is repeatedly compromising that yeah. position of privilege and opportunity uh, because of its uh, idolatry. So here we have a nation that God is working patiently with, but there's a lot at stake going on here. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us, uh, like the critics, will sometimes dismiss those sorts of things as though, oh, this God is just getting cranky. Right. And, right. and, that, and, and, cranky and, 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 and so uh, I, I think that's just an unfair, uncharitable representation of what is going on here, that God knew that this newly found faith of Israel, um, newly budded faith, yep. Uh, that there is a, it was a very tender plant that needed to be preserved, and there are a lot of things that threatened yeah. um, the identity Absolutely. and mission of Israel. Yeah, and you think a lot of people. I mean, be, uh, maybe is this is this a church issue or is it a, a modern church issue that we tend to find? We've even kind of renamed sin as brokenness or unhappiness or something, and it seems that if you if we were to look at the, all of Scripture, you would understand from the beginning that God is he is gracious and merciful, but He's also just and holy, mm -hmm. right? And that's ultimately that's through the thread of the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think that, and and I th it is helpful though. And I think some of the critics um, who are trying to see the God of love in the New Testament as being clearly manifested in Jesus, I think they're right to emphasize. Mm -hmm the greater priority of God's love. But I think we need to see that God's wrath is an expression mm. 
of God's love That's good. rather That's than good. as something that is pitted against it yeah. or opposed to it. Um, it or is, or is if of, he has emotions like us and he gets mad and throws off the finger. It's exactly. A, yeah. yeah. And, and so think of, think of a, you know, a parent getting mad when a child is experimenting with drugs or right. when someone's trying to sell drugs to his kid. Uh, there's, there's an appropriate outrage, anger uh, that flows from a spirit of love, yes. and in, in, in indeed the jealousy that God exhibits when the Israelites are compromising on their covenant mm. with God, uh, that God's jealousy comes from pain, God's jealousy comes from that heart of love that seeks to have his people rightly related to him. Uh, so, so I think it's we do need to emphasize, and I think it's often overlooked, that in the Old Testament we see great expressions of God's love, dedication, patience, and so forth. Um, but we also see that in the New Testament, love is intensified, yes. but wrath is also intensified, mm. like the book of Hebrews and Hebrews 2 yeah. and 10 and 12. If you know this transgression of the law received its just punishment, how much greater will the consequence be? How much more severe yeah. will it be for those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, yeah. for those who turn uh, and trample him underfoot and so forth? So there's a greater severity uh, that is also highlighted. Well so yeah. so we, we can't simply say uh, there's less wrath in the New Testament, more love. Uh, no, both of them <laughs> are intensified. Right. No, that's good stuff. So let's let's move. I got another question for you. Another one that's like popular out there about the whole slavery thing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, it's been heightened, obviously, in this political climate with mm -hmm. racism and everything. Is how in the world can I even serve a God? How can I even be a conservative in, in any in any in you know uh, definition of the word if God Himself condones slavery? Mm -hmm. And now we're trying to, you know, move all these monuments out and go and putting it all in one category. Did God con condone slavery like we know it? Yeah, this is a big uh, misunderstanding, right. misrepresentation that uh, a lot of our modern translations uh, have terms slavery, uh, slave, etc. And interestingly, the King James Version from 1611 only had one mm -hmm. reference in the Old Testament to the term, you know, slave. Right. And it's actually not even in the Hebrew text, it's actually inserted for smoothness of translation. And now we've got, after... Uh, colonialism, after Jim Crow laws, after a civil war, and so forth. I mean, we, all of these things, we use that term slavery all the more in right. the Bible, and problematically, it communicates language of antebellum slavery, mm -hmm. that we've got, you know, that what we read in the Bible is comparable to what was going on in the South. And this is, again, a, a terrible misunderstanding, and one of the things that I'm repeating yeah. is that if the Southerners <laughs> who had slaves were following the law of Moses. Right. Actually, slavery wouldn't have been an issue. You'd have been, you know, anybody involved in kidnapping, capital punishment. Right. Uh, that uh, that uh, <laughs> Which that is anyone the whole thing was based exactly on. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Or if a slave ran away, Israel was to make provision for a runaway right. slave in asylum, any of its cities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's asylum here, uh, unlike the say the fugitive slave laws right. in in the uh, again in, around the Civil War right. era. Um, you also have provisions that are made. People get into into slavery. Well, sometimes because there's war, yeah. uh, there's the war conditions, and and, and uh, those who are have no place to go mm -hmm. after war, they're not killed, but they're uh, they're doing various uh, you know menial service right. and so forth, hewing wood and carrying buckets of water yeah. and so forth. Yeah. So you do have that uh, that kind of a thing, um, but but for the for you know, and so you can have foreigners who are working for you sure. because of that sort of a uh, condition, but you know. With, again, within Israel, you have uh, these provisions for people who are impoverished. That even, you know that you have gleaning laws uh, where people who are poor can take uh, you know can pluck fruit from trees or the edges of a field that haven't been totally sure. uh, mown down. Uh, you have these sorts of provisions for the uh, for the people of Israel. That there is a concern for those who are you know, again this the, kind of the, the threefold vulnerable people. Right. You know the alien, <laughs> the you know the the the, uh, the widow and the orphan, right. uh, that those who are the most vulnerable were to be looked after. Why? Because you were slaves, servants, yep. you know, again, that's more like slavery, in the land of Egypt. And so they're to remember the servitude and therefore be kind to those who are foreigners in their midst. So there's a great concern to love the alien who is also to be under the same law. And the alien who is working in Israel, yes, you could acquire 
servants mm-hmm. to work for you. Again, it wasn't something dehumanizing. They were part of the family, right. keep in mind. Um, and also, if there is a foreigner, you know, again, he, he can actually, who is working for you, he can actually reach status where he can accumulate or acquire, same word used, right. acquire an Israelite right. to work for him. Yep. Again, it's not as though this is somehow chattel slavery. The Israelite can be acquired to work for him. That's the same language as used of God right. acquiring Israel uh, at the Exodus, Exodus 15. So God is acquiring the people there. It's a legal transaction, but it's not as though this is demeaning to the person. It's sort of like a team a basketball team having an owner, right. having players who are traded and so forth. We have that sort of legal right. language, but we don't think, oh, this is dehumanizing or anything like that. So so again, this is the kind of picture that we need to, I think, better understand, uh, that we actually have a very humanizing process, a preservation of the rights and dignity of those who are servants within Israel. And the term servant itself, mm. Eved, is yep. a neutral term. It can be positive, like Joshua and Moses are called, you know, an Eved Adonai, a servant of the Lord. Uh, so it's not an inherently negative term, but a lot of people... We've made it that the way, way. We right? have turned yeah. it into that, exactly. And so, uh, so to be a servant, well, just what's the context? The Israelites had once been slaves, right. servants in the land of Egypt, and God says, let my people go that they may serve me or be my servants In the wilderness. So you move from one negative state of servitude to a positive state of servitude. We're all serving someone, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the Bob Dylan thing, right? You've got to serve somebody. You've got to serve somebody, right? And obviously serving a just and holy and good God is is far different than than what we're thinking of when we think of Southern slavery or chattel slavery. And we've, we've, I mean... And which is a gross misunderstanding, which, mm-hmm. you know, it's when you, when you describe those three things, it's the complete opposite. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of the, all this is really actually a blessing. Mm-hmm. It's to, it's sometimes to even save families and to care for families. And people would have been dead mm-hmm. without the caring of them. And they bring them in. And then sometimes mm-hmm. there was debt, right? Mm-hmm. Someone owed debt to the yeah, person. Exactly. So they worked for them and then they right. worked it out and then they were free if they chose to be f- yeah. free. It was, a, it was an indentured servitude. Right. And so you worked, you know, the, you know, the basically for six years and you would be freed after that. Right. Uh, so you, uh, sort of like people who paid passage to come to the new world, they didn't have money, they basically worked for seven years, yeah. and then they were free and operated like any other citizen would um, uh, with their new, newly acquired status. Um, but it wasn't because they're somehow diminished in their person. They just had a certain debt to pay, and once they paid it, then they were free uh, to go about things. So, And they couldn't keep them beyond that. Right. In, in fact, even if you injured your servant, you gouged out his uh, eye or knocked yeah. out his tooth. Another spin on indentured yes. servitude. Yeah, there, there, uh, but uh, <laughs> there you go. But you have, but you, ha- but you have yeah. this uh, reminder that the you know injuries can actually free you from any kind of debt, uh, and, and you'd be released because you've been injured by uh, by your employer, the yep. person who has taken you in. And of course, the servants themselves, as they, they were typically part of the family within their tribal territories and clans and so on. Um, but if you worked for someone for these six years, then you had food, clothing, shelter, uh, you know, housing all provided for you. Yep. And so it was actually a, a very even secure, stable environment. Right. John Golden Gate, Old Testament scholar, says it's it's actually not a bad arrangement right. to, to be involved as a servant who is part of the household and has this kind of security and doesn't have to worry about all of those, those things that the person who's actually running the household has to worry yeah. about. No, it's pretty, that's, that's good stuff. Okay, the last one when it comes to this book and one of the ones that actually uh, makes me the maddest, but, uh, you know, I'm going to calm myself down and hear, hear a reasonable winsome answer from from you it's this whole idea of uh god being a you know a child abuser when he put his own son on a cross to die for us and we go back to abraham and isaac even and how could how could he want him to sacrifice this son and only at the last minute grab him when the angel was about to stab him and that just doesn't does doesn't gel with a the God that loves to some people, right? Is that mm-hmm. how can you do this? How can you abuse your own child? Yeah. How do you answer that? Well, not you know. Some people say, well, you know, you know, your child at a bedtime story is is asking, "Daddy, would you do this to me if God told you?" And <laughs> yeah, so forth. Right, so, right. so yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so uh, let's personalize it even a little bit more here. Uh, well, uh, what we have in, say, the story of Abraham, we'll go to uh, to the crucifixion, the death of Jesus in a moment. But what we have here is uh, a very unusual set of circumstances where God has already been 
talking to Abraham. Mm-hmm. God has been engaging with Abraham throughout Genesis 12 through mm-hmm. 21. There's been a lot of lead up to this point. God is, you know, Abraham is God's friend. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> and so there is this uh, deep relationship that is there. And God has made a promise to Abraham that he's going to bring blessing to the nations through whom? Well, it's going to be Isaac. God has promised that this child is going to be the means of blessing to the nations. Well, when God is providing for Abraham uh, earlier on, he says he's going to take him to a land where he's going to show him. He's, he gives, you know, he takes, Abraham takes matters into his own hands. But even so, he sends Ishmael away kind of test number one, sends Ishmael away, but God says, I'm going to make of him a great nation. So even though you're, you know, there's tension in the household, in the tent hold, um, that uh, things are tense, yes. uh, that uh, that that you, you send out Hagar and Ishmael, they will not die in the wilderness because they're going to make of Israel, uh, of Ishmael, a great nation. So he gets up early in the morning, saddles the donkey, so the same language that's used in the next chapter, where he does so with, with Isaac. But with Isaac, he is already, again, He's been assured that this is there's going to be a great nation that comes from, in fact, blessing to all the nations through through Isaac. Abraham is confident that God is going to do something, even though it sounds horrific. And keep in mind, too, that Abraham didn't know about God's view on infant sacrifice, child right. sacrifice. So this is something that was part of the practice. And God... Was that, was that going on in... in the culture around them? Oh, there were, yeah, that it was going on around them. And, and, uh, and so we have um, this sort of a practice that is, uh, that is taking place. And so Abraham, who's, you know, who is getting to know who this God right. is, is instructed in this way. But he knows that even if there is a sacrifice, he says, we will come back and we will worship. Yep. Yeah, we'll worship gonna, and we'll return. Somehow he's going to do something. Yeah. So yeah. He's, he knows he's going to come yeah. back with Isaac. Isaac, yeah. Just doesn't know how it's going to happen. So you so keep in mind that there's a narrative here that there's a history and Abraham is confident that God is going to deliver God is going to come through and even in the command that God issues there's a certain a number of commentators note that there's a certain tenderness mm-hmm. come please mm-hmm. and offer you know so there's this you know to, to, to that there is a an almost an understanding of what what may be involved here that there's this attachment but God is going to deliver God is going to bring him through and that's why the right. author of Hebrews comments that Abraham reckoned that God is able to raise even the dead right so so we have so it's not as though some father is told in the middle of the night kill your son R- right. Th- there's been a long history here of engagement and that this has been a miracle child that right, God has provided. Right. So so the context is completely different. It's unusual. There is a particular circumstance here that, you know, yes, all things being equal, you don't do that, but there is there is some sort of a a weight of historical engagement, narrative, friendship, trust, and so forth. Yeah. Well so that, faith. That, that takes I mean, place that's exactly the, the yeah. true definition of, of, of faith is trust and from mm-hmm. a relationship and he has evidence of it from his whole history. And he's like, well if this is what the Lord says to do, I'm gonna do it. Do you think it I mean, because when you put it in context a little bit, do you think that God was was t- testing Abraham's faith because the other cultures were willing to kill their own kids for a false God? Do you think that had anything to do with it? Or is it more well, in the line of what he was just trying to show yeah. through Christ. Yeah, well, I think that there is definitely something to be said for Abraham learning that whatever sacrifices you will have to make, it will not, I will not require you to do that of your children. And so here he is stopping him short, saying this is not going to happen. Yeah. And then from that point on, this becomes a model for, you know, for God's people to say, no, this isn't going to happen. Now, when it comes to the New Testament, uh, you know, Jesus is one who lays down his life. It's not as though uh, you have a lot of people view this as being three parties. You, know, you have God who's angry with sin, <laughs> right. the world that's sinful and loving Jesus who throws himself, uh, in, you know, in between in order to yeah, all to separate save. entities, not kind of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I they say, no, I mean, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit are all you know, they're, they're They love the world, <laughs> but they're also wrathful against sin. Mm-hmm. And so it is not a three-party 
view here, but a two-party, God and humanity. And so God is the one who loves the world, but also God provides for redemption for the world. And Jesus voluntarily gives his life. He says, no one takes my life. I lay it down of my own accord and take it back up again. So, so yes, the father is involved in giving his son, but the son gives his life as well. This is something that has been a divine arrangement from the from eternity, right. that God has been one who has been planning this redemption and that it is not something in which father and son are pitted against each other. But this is something that is done whereby the son gives himself willingly and also satisfactorily uh, that what he does in giving himself is sufficient to pay the debt mm. that we owe to God, but ourselves, you know, we cannot pay it. And we have analogies in this, you know, it's not as though that some people say, oh, that's unjust. How could the, the just die for the unjust? Right. Well, we have insurance policies, like uh, parents have kids on their policy. Right. And if the child does, you know, a teenage driver messes up the car, well, who is who ends up paying? <laughs> well, the parents yes. do, uh, or a broken window or something like that, or even a CEO of a company. There's been mismanagement of funds and the CEO doesn't honestly doesn't know about it. Well, he says, I take full responsibility right. for this. And he makes sure that all the debts are paid back and so forth. Um, or a company subsumes a smaller company that's struggling and uh, and pays off all of its debts and so forth and, and then it brings it into its own company so it'll be much yeah, better off right. and so forth. You know, is that, you know, that, shouldn't that we that shouldn't have done that. Just, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. the, you know, you didn't get your just desserts. Well, hey, if, if there's a handout, I'm going to take it. If there could be a way in which right. this can be rescued, then great. So so God is not doing anything unjust or, or going against these sure. laws of, of justice uh, within his own character. No, God is actually not simply forgiving, uh, but God takes justice yeah. into account. And, uh, and, uh, and so we see in the cross both love and justice uh, coming together. Yeah, I love that. Okay, we're going to, let's switch over to your other book. So I have two books that I, I mean, I have like a handful. I don't have a shelf anymore. It's all on my iPad. I have like 40 books that are always on my, like I, I, I reference them all the time. And this is one of those. It, true for you, but not for me. Uh, I love that book, hmm. by the way. I like it's got a more monsters up there, up there too. But I always go back to the to the truth thing because there's so much stuff going on in, in society around us that you know, with Oprah saying you know your truth and my truth, and everybody saying you have your pre truth, and, and we don't understand the difference between preferences and truth. Why did you Why did you write this book when you wrote it? What What was going on in your head? What did you see there? Like I got I got to write this. Yeah, back in the <clears throat> back in the nineties. Uh, and even while I was in, in graduate school, at, at getting my master's degree, I talked to people who were relativists, and <laughs> they would just say this sort of thing, well, that's just true for you, or yeah. you know, that's just your standard, or morality is just cultural, right. and so forth. And uh, this got me doing a little bit of digging on my own, and uh, realizing that, boy, a lot of these arguments are pretty pretty weak, well, yeah, and yeah. self-contradictory, and so forth. And so I just as I, I'm known, I'm, I'm like the handout king. So yeah. I, I, I was teaching a Sunday school class and I just put material together, researched and so forth. And, and that preliminary research turned into a, you know, that book, True for You But Not yep. For Me, which came out in the first edition in 98, mm -hmm. while I was uh, just, you know, had been working at, Mar been at Marquette University for my PhD. But I just saw that pluralism relativism, uh, both with regard to truth and morality, that these were regularly under assault, that more and more through postmodern uh, influences were, were buying into mm -hmm. this, that there really is no moral standard, that truth is just a matter of perspective and, and so forth. And so I just started to put together some material that would be a resource to, uh, to folks who are encountering these sorts of arguments or who are you to judge others or uh, that's just your perspective or, um, you know, it's arrogant for you to say that somebody else is wrong, etc. So, uh, so I just tried to organize a book that dealt with these kinds of slogans. And I began with kind of the general view of truth. Um, and, uh, and, and reality, uh, working my way up to dealing with um, moral uh, truth, uh, you know, objective moral values, uh, and then moving into the question of religious pluralism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what about all these other religions? Uh, is one religion true for one person but not for another? Or are all religions pathways to salvation or liberation? And then obviously leading into, you know, from, from that would be, well, if there are many religions, well, why is Jesus unique? Mm -hmm. uh, why should we pay attention to him? And then from there, well, if Jesus is the unique revelation of God, um, 
then what about those who never heard of him? So those are my kind of my five right. portions of the right. book right. Uh, in which I uh, t- uh, unpack those. And again, each p- part of that book has different slogans or uh, this, you know, kind of questions, equips that people right. give. And so I try to work through them and, and offer uh, a look at the assumptions behind those questions and, uh, and, and how we can creatively uh, address them. So what do you say to a, a, a relativist? Who, who I mean, who actually claim, I mean, who actually claims that? So no, 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 no. I mean, because you see it a lot. I, I think you can even switch it over into the gender identity kind of thing. Mm-hmm. There's, there, you know, there you can be anything you want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Doesn't have to. <clears throat> nothing has to comport with reality. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, not not only a skeptic, but I'm, I, it's relative, baby. You know, what yeah. it is, what it is. Yeah, Roger Scruton, uh, the philosopher, said that when a relativist uh, tells you. <clears throat> Uh, that everything is relative, he's basically asking you not to believe what he says. So don't. Uh, so he's basically saying, <laughs> yeah. it, it, there's no. in other words, there's, there's no reason that I should take your viewpoint seriously because it's just you know, tantamount to opinion, tantamount to preference, and nothing beyond that. If you're yeah. saying this is true and you ought to believe it, oh, you're not a relative. You're not anymore. a relative, yeah. So, Something's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you believe that if a person disagrees with you, then that person would be in error. Right. So, so again, you, so you can't can, even live. You can't even, yeah. you, there's no way to even like live in the world because yeah. we all, we all discriminate rightly or wrongly. We all have thoughts that we think are right. Mm-hmm. Everyone thinks yeah. that they're saying something. Why right. do we believe anything at all? Because yeah. we believe those things are true. Yeah. Um, we wouldn't other, believe them otherwise. And so we, you know, and, and again, when it comes to engaging with people who are relativists, I, I, I think it's helpful to remember that people who are relativists are going to be selective relativists. Sure. They pick and choose, usually about God and right, morality. Right, I always Those are the there. two areas. Right. Those are the ones, uh, yeah. But they're not going to disagree with you about, uh, and they're, gonna, they're not going to say. That's a baseball you know, yeah, the, on the ground. The, the Chicago yes. Bears, yes. Yeah. you know, they, they won for you, but the Green Bay Packers right. won, for, <laughs> won me. for me. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, they, they are not going to be relativists about who won the World Cup. Yeah. Uh, they're not going to be relativists about what is written on a prescription bottle. So whatever they're they not, consider that's true a for fact. the pharmacist, yeah, but right, not for me. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's true for it, the cop that pulls me over that yeah. I got a ticket, but not for me, so I don't have to pay it. Right. Yeah. It's like, exactly. Yeah, no. yeah. We find ourselves bumping up against reality right. over and over again, and this should be a cue that we are actually not the ones who manipulate reality. That we reality hits us squarely in the face right. very often. And uh, and so I, I think it's wise to remember that you know, relativists themselves are actually strong absolutists. <laughs> they hold to things like the absolute of tolerance, right. the uh, the wrongness, or the absolute of uh, not judging uh, or, or judging. Um, and so they will say, or, and they'll often tack on. They'll say, "You can do whatever you want." But they always tack on an absolute, as as just hurt, as long right? as you don't hurt anyone, hurt just as long as it's between two consenting adults. Yeah. Where, where, well, yeah. Why? Why yeah. add yeah. that? You just made that If up, you're a relativist, yeah. just relative. leave that yeah. lat- latter part off. Well, you uh, couldn't even say a statement if you're a relativist, it seems. Like, it would all come back and it's self-defeating, it falls mm-hmm. apart. And yeah, it's it's like if you say that there's no such thing as truth, you're basically saying that it's true, that there is no truth. Exactly. And so it ends up being a self-refuting, uh, self-undermining position. And I think it's a reminder to us that people are not relativists because they really intellectually thought this through. Right. It really is a matter of preference. I think a lot of people there's have emotions. been disappointed. There's emotions behind it, right? By, I think... You know, you know, you can you know, Whatever test this, yeah. but people have probably been disappointed by authorities. They've been let down. And so to trust someone who takes an authoritative position, right. well, they say, you know, um, kind of like the, uh, um, you know, the garden party song, uh, you know, you can't, you know, please everyone. So you may as well just please yourself. Right, right. Uh, and so there, I think people have that sort of a mindset. That um, well, why should I trust anyone? Why should I believe anyone? Why should I, um, you know, take that person as an authority because right. these authorities have let me down? And I think that that's one uh, avenue where we have an opportunity relationally to connect with the relativist, where that person needs to be helped to move from distrust 
to trust so, yeah, the um, through relationship that this is critical because I think so often they've been disappointed in relationship. And so, um, but again, if you want to, you know, the relativist is really poorly positioned mm-hmm. to be in a place where you enter into a, a marriage, a friendship of some sort. I mean, why would you right. trust anyone who's a relativist? Right. I mean, this is just a, a terrible setup yes. for for life. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, why would you want to hire a relativist yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. in your workplace? Yeah. Uh, you know, so so again, it is very self defeating, not just intellectually, but also from a very practical point of view. Right. You really harm yourself by uh, by being a relativist because it fundamentally dehumanizes you. It makes you a hollow. Mm-hmm person, uh, you are, you can't, you know, if there's no standard t- toward which you strive, well, why try to work on your character? Yeah. Why try to become a more uh, a better upright person? Or or, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So why should I try to strengthen relationships? Um, well, you know, and I, I remember speaking at a conference and a guy came up to me afterwards and he said that uh, he had, had been a relativist and his girlfriend, because she, he was so, he had been so selfish and uh, all everything revolved around him, she broke up with him because she couldn't commit to someone who never made commitments as a relativist. <laughs> And uh, that really got him, that really woke him up. He really liked this girl and, and uh, realized that truth mattered, that yeah. character mattered, that um, objective moral standards Absolutely. mattered. Yeah. And eventually that led him to find Christ. And he reconnected with this girl That's later impressive. on. And she saw the change that had taken place in his life, ended up marrying the guy. They, she became a believer. Good for her. They got married. Good for and, her. She, uh, she stood strong. Until, exactly yeah, right. That's, that's so, so again, it was a wonderful that's story good. to, to yeah. hear. So when, you, when you've talked to people about this subject, and I know it's hard in a, in a debate or when you're one-on-one with someone, you know, because there's a lot of emotions in there, right? Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. it takes a while for someone to go back and really think through it. Have you ever been like across the table here or at a class when you're teaching where a person, the light went off? Where they're like, <clears throat> of course, I'm a... a that was dumb my, for the last two years. I mean, thank you, thank you, Paul. Because yeah. I was like, I yeah. Well, I mean, uh, some. I mean, sometimes people will realize, oh yeah, that's yeah. that is dumb. It can't be or, right. This yeah. is this is this is silly. Other times, I think they it may just be where they want to hold their ground, try to put up a in a sense a disagreement and defend their position. Uh, but but I'll say you know I think before, I'll, I'll some, I remember one talking to one guy named Basil, and I was on a plane with him, and I said you know I, I was speaking plainly with him. Yes, you were. And yeah. he 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 uh, you know he he was giving me these relativistic lines. I said now now Basil, let me ask you a question. I said you know, think think before you answer this, because I think the way that you've been talking, I suspect that if you answer this question along the lines of uh, the way that you've been already responding to me. You're basically going to just self. You're just going to contradict yourself. Mm-hmm. So think. You know, just think about what you're going to say <laughs> yeah. here, because you're, you're basically trap, you're you're, yeah. you're basically. I, I think you're probably going to say, "Don't believe what I'm telling you." <laughs> I think that's what you're going to end <laughs> ultimately right. end up saying. Right. And uh, so he kind of <laughs> hesitated, good. paused, and you know, kind of. You know, I, you know, I kind of see what you're saying here, and he you know conceded that there's something uh, to the point that I'm making, and I need to think this through, or. Or they might say, okay, you've got a point uh, about relativism being self-contradictory. What if you can say, okay, maybe there is one thing that is absolutely true. Uh, Maybe it's the the view or the truth that everything is relative except that statement. Yes. I said, well, I mean, I think... I think we've we've already secured a victory here mm-hmm. um, by admitting that there is one absolute truth, and if there's one absolute truth, then maybe there could be others. In fact, in, in fact, the, you're using logic. Yep. Logical laws exist. You believe that those are binding. Yep. Uh, so you take those to be absolute in doing the reasoning that you're doing to draw that conclusion. Yeah. I said, so maybe there are even more. <laughs> so so I said, why restrict yourself to right. simply that? So I've had those sorts of yeah. conversations. Yeah, well, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Playing with the basil. Playing with the basil. Sounds, yeah. Sounds yeah. Like a, you get the, his little a thing. A spicy conversation with the basil. Very spicy yeah. and yeah. plain conversation, right? That's where we went. What, uh, what scares you about today, about society, America today, if anything? Mm-hmm. I mean, what's... Mm-hmm. What concerns you? Maybe you're not scared, but maybe like, yeah. hey, yeah. this is this is getting weird. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I think some of the things that uh, you know, I, just people denying what is real, mm-hmm. uh, and 
not really being concerned, I think, you know, even in the media, seeing these things, that truth does not seem to be valued. It seems to be political. It seems to be agenda-driven uh, very often. And uh, it doesn't matter if the facts uh, are stand against a particular position. What really matters is that your agenda wins. Right. And uh, it, again, this is not objective journalism. No. Uh, this is really you know, seriously problematic um, partisan uh, journalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, I think that's just a manifestation of some of these things that are uh, part of this relativistic stream of thinking. Basically, once you get rid of truth, well, all that you're left with is power. And if you can just bludgeon someone, uh, regardless of commitment, to, you know, to the truth, um, that's really, uh, you know, that's the kind of victory to pursue. If you can't beat them on the truth, yeah, it's uh, a whole new form level. of bullying in a way, it is. isn't it? Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think too, we're we're seeing. I mean, if, uh, you know, fundamentally, we're see, we're seeing a co continuation of spiritual warfare. Fun. Right. Yeah, I For think sure. that uh, we are. Uh, we need to remember that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood and so forth, that we are uh, up against a hostility that goes beyond you know, rational yeah. proportions where uh, where people are being single. You think of the persecution of the church mm -hmm. around the world yeah. and how Still, there's mm -hmm. such a silence in, when it comes to the media. People aren't reporting it. it uh, you know, and... Uh, you know, if some other minority is being persecuted, oh, um, then they'll bring that yeah. out. But it seems like the Christians are being singled out for uh, attack. I'm not saying that there aren't other minorities, sure. you know, sure. um, Baha'is or the like in, in other parts of the world. I, I understand that. But um, but for the most part, we're seeing a, a very strong stance against uh, the Christian faith. And a lot of the things that ought to be looked at more carefully um, are, are being, you know, again, there's no attention paid to those sorts of things. Like how are women being treated mm -hmm. in the Muslim world? Right. Uh, Ayan Hirsi right. Ali, uh, her book Infidel, and you know, she's talked about these sorts of things. Absolutely. And is a, a voice crying in the wilderness when it comes to, you know, where are the feminists who are going to yeah. rise up and stand yeah. up for these women in other uh, countries? Or is the tolerance and, yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. They're like fighting the fight, you know, that, the, that really is going on. I mean, this yeah. is horrendous stuff that's happening. Yeah. In comparison, I mean, Christians are allies when it comes yes. to uh, de defending women and the equality yeah. of women and so forth. I mean, you just don't see it. It's so utterly disproportionate, uh, the critique here in the United States mm -hmm. compared to what's going on in other parts of the world. Um, so again, there are uh, there are many things that we could say about the church too. I think uh, very often the church is uh, because you know, as kind of we talked you know the, the Canaanites and so forth in right. the Old Testament. Right. Well, I think uh, there's a lot of Canaan coming into the church, and we're seeing a lot of uh, you know a lot of moral compromise. I think a lot of celebrityism uh, within the within the church and uh, people being put onto a high pedestal, not being held accountable. Uh, and um, I think people not being well grounded. I think we've recently seen how people are people bailing just, on the yeah, faith, yeah. and you look at some of the reasons that they're giving, and you think, well, where was, you know, where was the training to help them with yeah. these sorts of things? Why, you know, it's, it's, some it's of this stuff seems so that, basic. It, 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 right, it, it is, but it, it it seems it's it all it all seems very very emotional, mm -hmm. right? They never leave and go. Well, it's because I looked in and proved that Jesus didn't rise mm -hmm. from the dead. Right. It's always an emotional thing. Usually a sexual thing, or uh, hey, you know what? Or just I, didn't work I, for I, me. I didn't or work for me, and I, I'm out. And I, even yeah. though I was spent 20 years talking this way, I apologize yeah. now for yeah. what I what was. And, yeah. But I mean, there, there's going to be a falling away anyway. There's, I mean, it's it, we're we're headed that way. I'm not surprised when these things are happening. I'm saddened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, yeah. And yeah, I mean, we talk about the anti-intellectualism within the church, and people who are, I think, all the more vulnerable to you know, to false teachings and. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I think being on guard against the temptations of culture and uh, succumbing to a uh, technological media age, which uh, I think can distract us from Absolutely. true discipleship. Absolutely. I think that's, that's a big one. One day we'll talk about that when you, when you come back on the show. Right. Now I want to I end with, it, with this little thing that I'm going to throw out. You're, you got a minute and you're on an elevator. And the elevator's going down, and there's there's a group of ten people in there. What yeah. what's your what's your final what's your mess what's your, a Paul Copan message to them as the elevator's about to go off the rails and slide down? Yeah. Well, that uh, I think of this in relation to the problem of evil. That if you're dealing with the worst kind of 
issues that that people throw at you. It's usually the problem of evil. And I'd say, give me Jesus any day in light of any problem of evil issue that comes up. This is the one kind of the major argument that right. people launch against the Christian faith. I'd say, if Jesus isn't the solution, then we're totally finished. Um, it's sort of like what Peter said, Lord, to whom else shall we go? Mm -hmm. You alone have the words of eternal life. Where else are you going to find the robust, kind of robust response to the problem of evil in which God patiently you know, works with fallen humanity, steps into yeah. this world, getting his feet dirty and hands bloody, facing injustice, uh, you know, uh, suffering, uh, cruelty, uh, dying in weakness at the hands of his enemies, giving himself for a broken world. I mean, what kind of a God is this that lays down yeah. his life for humanity? How can you not humanity? at least like that God? Yeah. You know, how could you hate a God that, that, that wanted to do that for you, yeah. even if you, yeah. Yeah, and then that this God is guaranteeing that everything is going to be made right, right. in the end. That so he's, Hitler, he is dealing with evil. Yeah, he ultimately he is, deals yeah. with it. But if you take only a, a, a this world right. view, a one world model, rather than a two world model, that there will be justice done. Uh, that God is going to make sure that everything is going to be set right. Cosmic justice will be done. I mean, what, what's atheist? Atheist. <laughs> what's their what, solution? What's their, what's, what, yeah, yeah. Hitler and Mother yeah. Teresa have the same. The same. And justice yeah. is not done. Reward is not given. Uh, you know, in a in a in a world in which God exists, in which God has given Himself through Jesus Christ. He's going to set things right. He's and going to wipe tears from the eyes. Yes. He is going to bring justice. He's going to bring happiness and self-sacrifice together uh, in the in the final in the final state. Yeah. So God is going to set things right in the end. But again, you're left with just a a, a big mess if yeah. you have some sort of a say naturalistic or atheistic yeah. alternative. Christ seems so, to be the best answer yeah, yeah. across the board. Yeah. So it was awesome having you here. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks Appreciate so it. Great much. to be it's with great. you. Hey, we'll see you guys next time on the Bub and Bob Show. Adios. Thanks, Bob. Thank you.